Hey everybody, this week I am joined by Thomas Gurry and Thomas is a computational and systems biologist interested in the translational applications of the human gut microbiome, which is a big topic right now. Uh, Thomas has developed a combination of experimental and computational methods to engineer the fermentation capabilities of a patient's microbiota in order to optimize health outcomes, which he has spun out into a company called Myota, which we are going to talk a lot about because this is a massive topic right now, Thomas. Um, so really glad to have you on. Um, how you doing, mate? Good, thanks. Uh, thanks for having me on. It's a real pleasure. Oh, you're very welcome. Whereabouts are you speaking to us from today, Thomas? You're normally somewhere interesting. Well, um, I'm dialing in from the lab, uh, the lab in uh, Geneva. So we have our um, commercial office in London, and that's where we do most of our business. But um, we do our uh, R&D in, uh, in the lab in Geneva. And um, so that's where I'm sitting behind us and some, some crazy machinery. <laughs> nice wet lab stuff interesting um it's been a while since i've talked about some sort of some like deep science but i have read i'd say a fair amount about what you do because it's it's incredibly interesting um and obviously it all starts with your research and so rather than me butchering this explanation um and i'm sure we'll get onto the research at some point but why don't you start at the beginning and tell us a bit about your story Sure. Um, so starting at the beginning, um, I grew up in Switzerland. Uh, I'm, uh, went to an international school and uh, actually always loved science, but um, it took me a while to figure out that it's something that you had to formally study to do any damage in and hmm. uh, ultimately ended up studying biochemistry. Um, I went to the UK for that, studied biochem at, at Imperial. And um, it was actually during that time that I started honing my um, interests because I was always interested in computers. I did quite a lot of programming as a teenager, um, launched my own website about Area 51 when I was about nice. nine. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, um, and uh, did that get shut down? Did that get, did that stay up? Like <laughs> not at the time, no. And uh, you know, I was pulling very little information of uh, of any veracity. <laughs> but uh, but that was my first attempt at coding. Nice. And uh, and ultimately, when I was studying biochemistry, I realized that there was this massive um, this massive gap in the life sciences, which was starting to be addressed, but mm. not by biologists. The gap being that there were there was all this data being generated, and all of a sudden we were moving towards a place where we could go from descriptive models of biology to more quantitative, predictive models, and um, so building computational models on the one hand or mathematical models, if you like, um, starting to you know. And I suffered from physics envy, like most uh, scientists that aren't physicists, so. I thought that um, where I needed to move into was more into that kind of stuff. And uh, in my final year at Imperial, started uh, delving into that, ultimately doing a master's in Cambridge in computational biology, which allowed me to really um, get into the thick of it. And um, that was the launching pad for me to go and do a PhD in that subject. Um, moved to Boston in the States uh, to study computational and systems biology at MIT, did my PhD there. Um, it was uh, during that time that I did some research on uh, the, 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 basically the link between um, the early events of protein aggregation and neurodegeneration. So um, did some molecular level modeling of uh, basically the proteins that uh, aggregate in Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease, um, found a few uh, key steps there that were potentially interesting drug targets, but it was in looking in detail into those molecular events that ultimately lead to this aggregation process, which at the end manifests itself as plaques in the clinic um, when they look at brain scans. Um, we're talking about the very early events, realized that there was some research then showing that those early molecular rearrangement events were modified by, um, in, in particular, things happening in the gut. And, uh, for example, curcumin is, is a modulator of alpha-synuclein 
aggregation, which is uh, early Parkinson's event. And uh, more and more data we're building to show that these early seeding events were happening in the gut. So that really got me interested in uh, the link between gut health and brain health, but also just in general realizing that, hey, this is this is way more interesting a thing than just a tube through which our food flows. And I should say that um, despite my focus today, I was never really interested in the nitty gritty of nutrition. Um, I came through it uh, to it through a scientific angle, ultimately. And, uh, and I think that um, the last piece that made me move into the microbiome was um, that because there were all these data generated thanks to new sequencing technologies, people could profile microbiomes much more effectively than before. Um, computational methods were needed. It was a sort of perfect storm. Um, but the last thing that I needed was, you know, I was really suffering from lack of impact uh, when studying, you know, these very like detailed molecular mechanisms in an academic science context. It's, you know, very intellectually stimulating and um, super interesting. However, you're far away from patients and, uh, and you're, you know, potentially decades away from impact to patients. And that, that I found frustrating. So uh, moved into the microbiome field where translational application is almost immediate because you can work with human patients right away. Um, you can analyze the microbiome non-invasively from stool samples and such. And so moved into clinical trials in the microbiome space, uh, trying to apply those tools and uh, it was at that moment, so I joined the MIT Microbiome Center, working under Eric Alm, who's a professor at MIT and a leading microbiome researcher. And we started studying how diet can be used to modulate the microbiome. Obviously, diet is one of the main drivers um, that is actually shaping the microbiome. It's, it's uh, the main input that it gets, the other one being your immune system. And... Uh, ultimately uh, realized that there was one dietary compound that you know is far and above the biggest and strongest modulator of microbiome and overall health as a result is dietary fiber um, so we did a number of clinical trials there and uh, the this led to us analyzing the differences between people in their ability to ferment specific fibers, break them down into short chain fatty acids. So that, by the way, I should say is one of the key roles of the gut microbiome. It's actually probably, if you had to give it one core function, that would probably be it. Um, it's to ferment dietary fiber into short chain fatty acids. We can't get short chain fatty acids from anywhere else. They have to come from bacteria. We can't make them ourselves, um, but they're super critical to health. And it's this crazy symbiotic relationship between the bacteria that live in our guts and us. And by the way, it's not so, it shouldn't be so far in a concept. If you think about say ruminants, cows, they get all their energy from this, right? Like all they don't, they can't break down cellulose. They have these huge stomachs full of bacteria that do it for them. And we don't get all of our calories that way. We only get about 5% of our calories that way. But the short chain fatty acids that are made have all these other impacts on our health through our immune system and metabolic health and so on. And it's the main energy source for colon cells. So, so ultimately, you know, fiber all of a sudden went from this is super boring thing to like this, uh, ultimately a drug that isn't a drug. It's available at the supermarket. It's safe. And uh, it could be a solution to so many problems we have around chronic disease. Um, and that was ultimately the, the thing that led me to become super interested in that and spin out myota also based on one last piece of information, which is, you know, at that point, you might ask, as I did okay, why, why don't we see more fiber-based interventions? I mean, this, there's a piece missing here. It doesn't make sense, you know? Fiber should have crazy health claims. It's, it's super important for health. And the reason is, actually came from my research, which was that different people have different microbiomes. And so what that means ultimately is that you have a, uh, an ability to ferment specific fibers and not others, depending on which bacteria you have. Um, sounds pretty simple. But what that means in practice, if you do a clinical trial with one fiber, is that maybe 30% of the patients enrolled will be effective at breaking it down into short-chain fatty acids. And 
then you're already pretty close to placebo in some indications. Um, you assume that no indicate no if, uh, intervention is 100% effective and you've killed your signal there. It's gone. That's it. Even though for some patients, it was extremely effective. So you really have to account for these differences between people and either give them the right fibers for their microbiome or the approach we've taken at Myota, blending together different fibers based on the diversity of people's microbiomes and our understanding of those fermentation capabilities across the population into single blends that work well across different microbiome makeups. And essentially, then you can get clinical efficacy from from clinical trials. And so that's, that's where we're at with Myota now. That's awesome, man. It's an incredible story. And I think one thing that hits me straight away is obviously you're someone, you mentioned the word impact and you're, you're clearly, you've clearly been searching for that and deeply within academia to become, I mean, certainly an expert in computational biology, how that pertains to the microbiome, the prevention of Alzheimer's and Parkinson's even. And you mentioned that that gap between academia and entrepreneurship in the search for impact, right? People often move from academia to entrepreneurship in in, in the search of impact. But in doing so, you found a frontier, haven't you? You found a frontier in the in human knowledge. And I think those are i think well they're, they're more common than we probably think because we don't know what we don't know but yeah nutrition totally and, and you mentioned nutrition is kind of like the wild card here because like it's not nutrition that we're talking about but you end up at nutrition because of the problem that you need to exactly. solve and how you need to solve it but i can even remember at medical school like nutrition was like one third of one module that you just sort of did and you got 30 questions at the end of the year and you had to get like 20 of them right 10 of them right and that was it you got your, you you'd, you'd passed your nutrition bit it's never something we knew right. and it's getting longer and longer since i went to medical school i'm sure it's different now but the point remains though that the knowledge around fiber microbiome short chain fatty acids preventing the aggregation of plaques that is all pretty deep science but i mean i'm gonna say relatively new you might tell me something different but my question now becomes of everything that you've just talked about how much of that would you say is common knowledge and I, when i say common knowledge i mean like where where is the knowledge of the general public right now? Do you think where's the knowledge of the scientists right now that's evidence based? Do you think? And mm -hmm. it strikes me that we might be on the steep part of that curve because the microbiome is not a new word now. That that is around. That right. definitely is seeping into the consciousness of people, and definitely the the average person's knowledge particularly those that are you know the quantified self with all the wearables and all the all the stuff but also those that are pretty keen on nutrition right like people people know quite a lot about this stuff now um or certainly increasingly so so where do you think we are broadly when you think about everybody listening to this podcast we might have to bring some people up on a journey through this so like where are we now and where's the science yeah, it's a great question. I think um, that is that's the opportunity, by the way, for impact in general coming from academia or academic science is that the science is generally um, out of sync with right. the general population. And the ivory tower thinking means that, you know, people worry about grants and publishing papers and and trying to generate new impactful science but not necessarily translating that into the real world. Right. And so that's where my answer comes from is that ultimately, I think the state of microbiome science now is, you know, um, I think it's still an extremely exciting, exploding field, but it's also, um, there were, there was about a 10 year, 15 year period where people were just basically measuring the microbiomes of everything and writing papers about that, looking at correlations between things. And, you can always find correlations, right? So that's the first um, problem that the field hit, which it, every field encounters at some point, big data in general. You know, correlation is not causation. And so you can find correlations between microbiome makeup and such a disease. 
but that doesn't tell you anything. It might be related. For example, some diseases change the way you eat, and that affects your microbiome. So maybe it's coming the other way around, you know? And um, these are, so that was the state of the field before. I think we've moved in, in the science space to a state where people are really trying to understand the mechanisms, and that's hard. Then you're going away from systems science, like which is older age now, and certainly was when I was in, in graduate school, um, to back to slightly more reductionist methods where you go, okay, there's something really going on in this system about this component. Let's study in isolation and then do lots of work in the lab and so on to really understand the mechanisms here. That I think is where the field is at, which is great because it means now that the proper rigor has been instated and we can really start to move forward on good things. So we're seeing really exciting things like new therapeutics at pharma grade therapeutics of like, you know, um, clinically effective probiotics that, uh, that are, are drugs, not over the counter kind of probiotics that we that we see already and have seen for a long time. That I think is, is happening right now in a real way. And that's extremely exciting. Um, but then when it comes to the state of the general population's understanding, I think that there's still quite a lot of work to be done there, though, like you say, I think we're on the steep part of that curve because people now know about the microbiome. Just about everyone's seen a documentary about it at some point and uh, or read a book or something, maybe multiple. Some people know a, an awful lot about it and have been in, sort of integrating it into their lives for quite some time now. Um, what uh, where I see a gap between the science and the general population is essentially understanding the uh, let's say clinical potential of different aspects of the microbiome. I think we see a lot of wild claims out there that people were capitalizing on for some time. Um, so quite a few companies spin out 10, 15 years ago and crash in spectacular fashions. Um, doing this kind of stuff that's very, you know, cowboy like behavior, really you know, distancing themselves from the science. And, um, but by the way, when I was in academic research, that was a real source of bitterness amongst my colleagues, seeing mm -hmm. all this, you know, horrible bastardization of the science. Um, but that, that gap is closing now because I think that customers are becoming more, um, educated about this stuff. And, uh, they've seen, too many claims of science backed this and that and ultimately it's just another probiotic isolated from yogurt and just given a fancy spin um so so i think that that's the last bit that needs to happen is that we can't go from you know to to, to exaggerate a little bit we can't we can't keep taking bacteria that have always been in our yogurts and saying they're going to cure autism and raising a hundred million dollars and doing some ads about this, you know, like, I think that that can't keep happening because it's really bad for um, the field in general. And it, and it takes us away from something that is, there's a huge clinical vision for the microbiome. I think that it's, it's, you know, it should be chapter one of an immunology textbook. Now it's, it's how you train your immune system from birth, and like, it's, uh, it, it's super exciting in terms of impact on chronic disease and offers so many solutions, but we're not going to get to those solutions effectively and in a, and in a rigorous manner, unless, you know, some of this hype gets done away with. And the, the last piece there is that I think that, you know, um, investors and people like uh, venture capital funds, they, they also, you know, were victims of that first wave of hype. And I think they're much more savvy now. So I believe that actually, despite the struggles that the space has gone through in the last few years, we're actually at a really exciting time where I think that in five or 10 years, we're going to see just, you know, much more interesting microbiome based solutions um, and uh, not based on just correlating stuff on some data set that yeah. doesn't mean anything if you see. Yeah. Me. Yeah. So tell me about the re your research specifically and start at the beginning for me in terms of fiber being turned into short chain fatty acids and how that relates to plaques protein aggregation neurodegeneration alzheimer's parkinson's disease because this this is this is this is real this is really exciting science hmm. right yeah so that is uh 
So there's still, you know, for the sake of uh, rigor, I have to say that there's still a lot of work that needs to be done to connect those two pieces in a rigorous way. However, said every, said every scientist ever. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, it's the disclaimer that <laughs> that probably people uh, should be making more, and at the same time, Agreed. I make too much. But Agreed. at the same time, it's uh, it, so. But the the link is as follows. I mean. Um, short chain fatty acids and particularly butyrate, which is one of the three main ones, um, are, are highly anti inflammatory. Butyrate actually is a key modulator of chronic levels of inflammation in the gut. And so, um, for example, people suffering from inflammatory bowel disease, it's been well established that they tend to suffer from a deficiency in butyrate production in their microbiome, um, which is one of the things that keeps them away from flares. So, uh, so butyrate is super critical in modulating inflammation. Now, it also circulates in the blood, and uh, short chain fatty acids have a mechanism of action, uh, multiple actually, but that doesn't limit itself to the gut. Um, it can actually affect theoretically any cells because it's they're actually gene expression uh, modulators through specifically histone deacetylase inhibition, but that's, a, that's maybe getting a bit technical. But the point is that circulating short chain fatty acids potentially impact other parts of the body as well. And that would certainly make sense based on all the data we're seeing in the links. So, uh, the gut inflammation thing in and of itself might be enough to cause a link between that and, um, plaque deposition, which, you know, the, the key point is that neuroinflammation is actually the strongest correlate with um, cognitive decline rather than plaques and neuroinflammation and plaques have some kind of complex relationship but the key point being that it seems that neuroinflammation is driving the symptoms that we're seeing in these diseases right and that's why people are now turning to things like prebiotics which are ultimately forms of fiber that are fermented into short chain fatty acids in a lot of cases as an anti-inflammatory mediator to make sure that we can keep levels of inflammation as low as possible, not just in the gut, but systemically, which ultimately should have impact on neuroinflammation. And that would theoretically slow the progression of disease. Because as we know, there are many patients that have a huge amount of plaques, but no symptoms. And, uh, and similarly, it's a, I guess the, num the amount of plaques that don't correlate so well with uh, cognitive decline, whereas neuroinflammation certainly does. And so I think that's the super exciting link. And it turns out that inflammation is linked to so many other diseases, depression, anxiety, you know, even diabetes, but uh, inflammatory bowel disease, of course, arthritis. And so actually modulating inflammation through something as simple as fiber in the gut is a potentially extremely powerful approach to preventing these diseases or managing their progression. Um, I do want to just say, though, that like fiber here, I don't believe, unfortunately, yet there's not enough evidence that it's going to cure any of yeah. these conditions, right? But the key point is that it'll prevent them because it's lifestyle and diet, ultimately, that has often led to this chronic disease burden we have. And so... I know the business models aren't established for prevention and reimbursement plans there aren't super good. And so pharma is never really interested in that. And I mean, what are you going to run a 40 year clinical trial? Mm -hmm. Like it's, it's tough to tackle, but yeah. ultimately that's the solution. You know, uh, we need to be much more preventative in our approach and then of course manage the disease as it progresses and treat it and look for cures. Sure. But a key part is prevention. And I think that's where fiber and the microbiome are uh, brilliant, you know? Yeah, and it's probably worth saying that, you know, so many of those things are multifactorial and this is obviously one part of, you know, a broad spectrum of things that can prevent and, dare I say, treat, particularly when you talk about clinically effective probiotics and things like that. That's super interesting. Right. But I think there is something in that, though, which is the the average person or even the average clinician might not be thinking right now in the right way if we fast forward 20, 30, 40 years to where this science goes, they might look, we might be looking back at a time where we were leaving so much on the table by not appreciating the value of the microbiome and 
gut brain axis and right. all these different all these different things because it, f- it feels almost like we're on the precipice of something and i think there's always a couple of different things i mean it's it's really interesting to me actually that you talked about the the business models and things like that because i think so much of the new science pertains to and the new trials and the new ways that we think about doing things pertains to prevention and you're right it's incredibly different right. it, difficult out the gate to just produce the business model for prevention and so the burden of the testing tends to fall on those that are willing to put their hand in their pocket to optimize their health and Exactly. You know, arguments aside about, you know, high income versus low income and, and disparity and equity and equality. You know, there's there's all of that, that that we've talked about on this podcast quite a lot. But ultimately, that is where a lot of this is being done and tested for those people that put their hands in their pockets and do wish to optimize their health. But seemingly, there's totally. a lot of ground to be made. And I think that's that's, I guess, the point I'm trying to make here from what you've said, which is that there's a heck of a lot of science still at this frontier. There's still lots to do. Even the bits that we've done a bit of, there's still plenty more research that we can do to define things. But it seems like there is a large amount to be done and a large amount to be gained from people doing this. Mm -hmm. So I think what we're talking about here is broadly flipping this whole disease and treatment thing on its head and thinking prevention before disease. And so exactly. given what you know and understand about this, how important is that? And how important is that translation element? Because you mentioned that the science is further ahead than, than I suppose, public discourse. So right. how important is it the attention is now drawn to that more translational element. And I guess that's where myota comes in, right? And what you've tried to do, mm-hmm. because this is your attempt at doing that in this exactly. element. And so, yeah, I guess how important is it? And I suppose the answer is important enough to start a company. So like, um, talk <laughs> no, to me, talk to me about question, that. You know? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, I think it's actually fundamental and that's where the gap is between science and the general population and where the general population is not being served by science. I think we saw it parenthetically in uh, the kind of climate space, right? Scientists have known for too long that Mm -hmm. we have a serious, serious problem and they've been saying it and I don't want to act like scientists haven't risen to the task. They've been trying their heart out to try and get people to understand, but their channels aren't effective and it's not their forte communicating science or even translating it into worlds in real world solutions. That's just not what they do. And so um, there's a real problem there because I think scientists have so much to offer and clinicians they're doing clinicians are doing a lot of research in the microbiome right now. And um, in, in fact, it's a translational field by definition almost. And so clinicians have a super important role to play with scientists combined. But, but the key element is that they need to start communicating this stuff um, to the wider public, not just in clear terms that they can understand, because I think that that's where a lot of it gets lost, is that they oversimplify it into messages that can be either exaggerated, overblown, or spun in pretty weird ways that like result in kind of dubious companies and people trying to capitalize on that opportunity. So I guess what I mean is that like making an effort to my view is we should give people a little more credit. They're not that stupid. You know, they're able to I, I love yeah. Carl Sagan's example of this, that like, you know, the average American is able to understand baseball statistics extremely well. And this is complicated stuff. It's sure they can understand science. The problem is you have to show them why they should bother. Right. And 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 I think that this is this is what matters we know now how much diet can play a role and we know how the microbiome can play into preventing these diseases um we know what happens when you get these diseases so somehow you know having more concerted messaging about that and getting results that we're seeing in the clinic out into the public so that the public can say oh wow here's this company that's claiming that they can cure my xyz disease with some microbiome intervention that's like out of nowhere 
And then here's this clinical trial done by the NHS where they're showing something, you know, like way earlier than that, but progress. And then mm. they can understand, okay, where are we really versus what's being claimed and focus on good solutions. And I think that then there's a lot of other stakeholders that have a role to play there. Dietitians and nutritionists who can inform, you know, the information, the, their customers and patients with this information and color it a little bit more, contextualize it a little bit more. Um, and basically, I think that there should be more dialogue between you know, general practitioners and other people in the healthcare system that interface directly with patients who come to them with, hey, I heard that I can do this and my microbiome is like responsible for this disease or whatever, to be able to get them to talk to them about that and not just say, oh, no, it's crap or, you know, yeah, can't hurt. Just more like, well, okay, you're right, but here's where the field's at, and here's where this is what we know. And so, this is something that my supervisor at MIT used to always say: um, is you know, if there's one thing that we know about the microbiome, is that you should eat more fiber. That's what you know. There's a lot of science, and it's super interesting, but that is one thing we know for sure. And so, you know, making sure that these messages get out there rather than getting stuck because it's not a very sexy message. It's sort of like, well. Your grandma's always told you to eat your soup. So mm -hmm. what, am we, what am I learning here? There's nothing interesting here. This is, but, but like, let's, let's explain why and the role that eating your fiber can do in maintaining your health and preventing these things. I feel like if people were given a bit more credit, they would, they would take more ownership over that problem. I, my I, approach I, I agree with you. I agree with you. So obviously myota now comes in to this story because this is, this is you translating your science into impact and getting this into the hands of people. So tell me about starting this company. So that's where, you know, um, it, that's what I was trying to get to is this whole, this, uh, we've got this potentially extremely effective, not just effective, but impactful intervention in fiber. There's a messaging problem. We need to get that message disseminated. And more importantly, I think, and this is where startups come in, there's a business model problem. There's no real business model there. Um, you know, there's no reimbursement scheme for some preventative nutrition thing. Um, nothing, no, no justification for doing clinical trials that cost millions and millions without some kind of IP around that, which is what a food that you can get from your garden like it's going to be a there's a problem there a market failure if you like and uh and so that that was what excited me is like wow there's this super impactful piece of knowledge that you know academic science has come up with now and it's well validated and we're learning more and more but you know it's it's ready for you, you people scientists can work on this for 50 years but the information's ready for the public that's for sure you know and so so first get that out Secondly, why hasn't it been more effective? Well, because of what I mentioned at the start, people are different. They have different microbiomes. And so you have to give them the right blends of fibers to make sure that they, they can actually benefit. Um, and that was the piece of knowledge that came from the lab that was like, okay, cool. We can have some impact now. We can explain why these trials don't work and why we can make trials effective and why can, and show that this stuff can really work. That, that was all uh, playing into it. But the real challenge there was, okay, so how do we build a company out of this, given that you can't really protect fiber? And so there's two approaches to that. There's either you take the marketing approach and say, well, we're not going to protect anything. We're just going to grab as much of the market as we can and generate a profitable business there. And then hopefully things will work out. Or, and I think a lot of people are taking an approach that approach, and I don't want to... Um, let's say, be critical of that approach too much because they're ultimately working towards the same thing, but it doesn't address the market failure. There's no protectable asset here. And we can, we've seen this with companies like Uber and stuff where they just, you know, get a lot of hype, but there's no protection around what they do. And so there's nothing stopping other entrants into the market. And then it becomes this crazy price war. And it's not really, you know, um, actually, well, you're not actually getting to a defensible position, which is ultimately necessary for a startup to continue to raise venture capital and ultimately exit or, you know, reach impact. Um, so the other approach is to find some kind of defensible blend of fibers. 
And, um, and that is where we've taken our approach, which is to stay really close to the science. Sure, we offer our products direct to consumer, and we do that to understand how people interact with it. Um, we get incredible feedback that keeps us going in terms of the impact it has on people's lives. And all of that is great. And we can collect real world evidence from our customers, but ultimately focusing on, okay, how do we understand people's differences in their ability to break down fiber and combine that knowledge into blends of fibers that work for everyone? And two, how do we get that which is ultimately something that can be protected through patents, for example, um, which on an, in and of itself is rather a weak position because someone can just tweak it a bit and then it's pretty effective, but like different. Combine that with clinical data, do clinical trials, have efficacy data in particular indications so that we can make the case to stakeholders, payers like the NHS, you know, insurance companies, and so on, who have a real, you know, impetus to find cost-effective solutions and and subsidize them where they can. Um, we need to do that through clinical trials, and uh, ultimately, those data combined with a particular formulation, which is ours, um, is a protectable asset, and it's something that can be then incorporated into foods, and then you have a food that has a health claim from, say, the European Food Safety Authority that says that this will prevent progression of diabetes or something. I mean, that's the potential of fiber. But in order for that to happen, it has, that health claim has to somehow carry be protected. Otherwise, no one's going to finance the trials. They'll just wait around for someone else to do it, and no one's going to do it because it costs a lot of money. And, um, and so our strategy at early stage was really trying to both get the science ironed out to something where we can have good blends, but in parallel, working on that business model and essentially IP strategy to come to a place where we could spin out Myota and know, okay, we can go out there and we can really build something that is an asset for stakeholders in the healthcare system and investors who want to put fuel behind this. Um, so that was that was really the biggest part of the early stages of the journey, I would say. Mm. So the defensible blends, they are made based on what? Because looking at your website, you've got a few different blends for different things. So how are you right. making those blends? What are they, I suppose, made up of? What? what are the different results you're expecting or are you looking at it in terms of target i say customer but patient user whatever however you define that but like sure is it is it the person receiving it that you're grouping around or is it the the mixes and the formula that does a certain thing how, how do you play that yeah i mean it's a great question the thing is that um the short chain fatty acid angle namely boosting short chain fatty acids through specific blends can be addressed by essentially understanding how different people ferment fiber into short chain fatty acids and how their microbiome plays into that. So you're optimizing for the most amount of conversion into short chain fatty acids, right? That's what you're optimizing Exactly. Well, for. so that's one part. Exactly. So that's one piece of the puzzle, which that, that optimization, it gets done by studying lots of people and seeing how different they are what are the best fibers to combine in what proportions right. so that the mix is effective across the most people. But that only gets you to short chain fatty acids. The problem is, or it's not a problem, but rather the, um, the sort of missing piece is that there are other things that fiber do. Uh, for example, fibers are um, modulating postprandial glucose response so when you eat you have a sugar spike mm. and you can measure that these days with you know continuous glucose monitor when you eat fiber and these are health claims that have been well established and are available from the european food safety authority you're allowed to use them if you have the right fibers in there um, in europe which is that it regulates these sugar spikes and um and we found that you know uh, that's certainly true but like what that means that's not actually happening through short chain fatty acids because short chain fatty acids ha get generated over hours in your colon um and it's more of a chronic effect um whereas the 
postprandial response is something that's kind of immediate and it's more of a mechanical effect of fibers where one of the one of the explanations is the is that the sugar in your the glucose in in your food is in a matrix of fibers so it's less it's not just in a pure pill form you know and so your body isn't absorbing it as aggressively but um that those are benefits of fiber that we can't shouldn't we shouldn't overlook and so we're we're about to trying to leverage all the possible benefits of fibers and that's how we've then tailored blends to different needs that's not to say that they are um exclusive to those needs but rather optimized to them they all come from the mm. same core and so one for example is optimized towards metabolic health and that's one that we do clinical trials with um in the sort of diabetes context context that one leverages both the short chain fatty acid potential to regulate insulin sensitivity and metabolic uh, parameters like that and the sort of post meal sugar spike question uh, and we we combine both of those into that blend the another one is uh, all in on anti inflammation our immunity booster mix which is really just all about short chain fatty acids there you know, at the expense of the mechanical benefits of fiber, which also are, by the way, really um, beneficial for things like bowel movement, frequency, and regularity. Another great thing about fiber, you know, um, and what people have called for ages roughage. Um, it's mm. uh, th this is this is another important aspect of fiber. And uh, and if you want to go all in on short chain fatty acids, well, the most fermentable fibers aren't the ones that give you those benefits. So. Um, that's a mix that's tailored more towards that. And then you've got another uh, dimension, which is people suffering from irritable bowel syndrome. Um, IBS is, you know, obviously a massive burden in a lot of countries. It's not one that's taken super seriously by the healthcare system either. So there's a real pain point there. Um, and people are hyper motivated to, to try and find solutions. The, the real issue that we try and address with that mix um, is that the solutions for IBS right now have been to basically take out anything fermentable from your uh, from your food, the FODMAP, FODMAP diet, low FODMAP, right? And take take everything fermentable out so that the microbiome doesn't ferment them uh, and create this gas accumulation amongst other things, and then reintroduce uh, things slowly. And that's that's fine, but the problem is when you do that, you're starving your microbiome, and then you know, God knows what else you're doing to your body in the process, right? So there needs to be somehow a way of restoring the food for the microbiome, namely fiber, in the context of someone suffering from a much more sensitive gut, and that's why we've developed a low FODMAP fiber mix that we know from our lab is fermented into short chain fatty acids, but more slowly so that it doesn't create this huge accumulation of gas that is very uncomfortable mm. for people with very sensitive guts, but still creates short chain fatty acids. So you benefit from those health outcomes and feeds your microbiome. So you don't get other um, impacts there. And so that actually uh, is the, the third blend. And, and essentially, if you like, they're all tailored to particular needs. But if someone picked one at random, they would benefit. That is the truth, I think. So it begs the question then around personalization and is the business model there for an individual to have their microbiome tested to figure out is that the, you know, what, what's my, mo what would be the most optimal? What would be the perfect mix for me if, hey, like this is what my microbiome's doing and this is what I want? Or maybe you don't even need the this is what I want, but you can just tell it from the microbiome. Is that, is is that business model viable? Well, it's a great question. Actually, that's one of the places we started. Um, certainly, the science is there. What I mean by that is actually we have IP on this, and we've we've studied this from our database. We built machine learning models that can predict which fibers someone's microbiome is good at fermenting into short chain fatty acids, which means then that, oh, well, you can combine them in certain ratio, and then they've got the personalized mix that's ideal for them. Um, true. But then there's the business model problem, like you said, <laughs> which is that personalization is hard, as many, many companies know. Um, you're, you're talking about a huge operational burden. You're slashing your 
you know, margins in a major way um, by having to weigh these things out. And unless you've got the scale and level of automation to pull that off, it's not, it, it, it no longer becomes cost effective is I guess my point. And so then you're looking at a, a trade-off between, you know, cost efficiency and maximum impact versus precision and, uh, and you know, essentially the highest degree of clinical efficacy in that single patient. Um, I happen to think that you can get a lot of the benefits from a blend, um, which compared to not having one at all. So that's why I feel very comfortable putting personalization aside as a development thing that we are developing. Mm -hmm. How are we going to get to personalized fiber mixes? <clears throat> but um, but still leveraging this diagnostic technology which we've developed and we're going to be launching shortly is a, is a microbiome kit that allows you to measure your microbiome and which fibers it's best at fermenting. Um, that allows you to until we figure out the business model and <laughs> how you know how to scale that effectively allows you to go out and and eat the foods that you're best at fermenting into short chain fatty acids on the side. Um, I think this is information that people can benefit from, and uh, and that's what our microbiome kit is going to do. Amazing. Um, I feel like I, 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 it's just been a real education, I suppose. In I mean the the value of fiber. It's so funny because we've talked about this in this episode, right? It, the things that your grandmothers say about. Uh, right. about roughage about fiber about regularity about all those things you know like this this is yep. sort of old wives tale stuff coming to the it fore is. but in a much more scientific and precise way with knowledge of the benefits beyond what i suppose we just thought they were i think the short chain fatty yeah. acids thing for me is fascinating because i think the link between the gut and the brain is fascinating it's it is still a frontier there is still so much science to it but when you when you think about how are we going to live in the next 30 40 50 years like you wonder exactly. where's the biggest lifestyle thing that we're going to change well the fastest changes at the moment are in diet nutrition and what that's doing for our health broadly i think it exactly. is such it's it's an area where i think there's this i feel like there's this mismatch between like if you follow the path of least resistance in the world and in life, you'd end up on processed foods and takeaway stuff. And like, you'd end up like you have to work hard at the moment, I think with your choices right. and with your resolve mentally and with your discipline, right. and even with your ability to find some of this stuff to have your 30 grains a day, <laughs> whatever you need for the optimal microbiome, whatever it is. But like, at the moment you have to work quite hard for that and i think there's a big there's a big frontier there i think for all of us which i think as the business to your point as the business models start to come about which will be through increased knowledge in the public domain which will increase the amount of better choices that people want to make which then the business model will show itself of like well stick a exactly. stick a shop like this on the high street stick a place that make these restaurants will want to make different choices as we've seen with i suppose veganism has has been uh, quite an obvious right. example of that where things have changed relatively quickly in response to public demand and so I suppose to bring this full circle, the the gain, the real gain that can be made is translating that knowledge and translating the positive effects of what fiber can do, which ultimately is what you're doing at Myota. And I think it's um I think it's incredible work that you guys are doing, as you know, um, because we've talked before. But I you know, I, I think, yeah, I, I think where you're playing is such a such such an interesting and an important place. Um and yeah, I obviously wish Thanks. you all the best of luck, mate. I think it's quality. Appreciate I also it. think as well, just obviously the you've mentioned machine learning, and you and you've mentioned, and I'm, I'm glad you have because now I can justifiably put this out on a health tech podcast because now there's machine learning at the back of it. Cool. But but ultimately, that's what you're building a company around. You're building a company around the principle of what fiber is going to do for human health. It's just, it just so happens that technology will sit at the back of this to create a business out of it. And I think that is just an important thing that actually you're not leading with, Hey, look at our cool tech, look at what we're going to do. Like, isn't this wonderful? 
it's actually like, well, no, here's the science. And I like that. You didn't start your story with like, here's all the businesses I had at, at, by 10 years old. It's like, you're not, you're not right. born in that sphere. You're born in the, I want to make impact through science sphere. And I think the point I just wanted to make before we end is, is the credibility, I suppose, that sits behind what you do is in you and your background and the fact that you've been working on this for decades by the sounds of things. And actually, whilst it might not need to be a registered medical device and software and all that sort of stuff that doesn't stop it being a bloody good idea <laughs> actually being right. able to create a lot of impact right so um yeah all credit to you thomas if people want to learn more about myota they want to get their hands on some even because this is available to the public um i am a user um yeah how do they do so um, well, the easiest way is to visit us on our website, uh, myotahealth.com, and uh, that's M-Y-O-T-A, uh, health.com, and uh, there you can actually order our fiber blends and uh, very shortly our microbiome kit as well. Um, and always happy to hear from people if they have any questions, so feel free to write to me at thomas at myotahealth.com. Always happy to engage as well. Awesome. Um, and it's been a pleasure having you on, mate. Thank you.